introduction. So we had a nice time together. <laughs> so, uh, as he points out here, co-author of the Introduction to Mechanics, co-author, he was co-author with Daniel Kleppner. I'm going to talk about the book for a while, about how it came to be, and then I'm going to spend some time talking about uh, kind of astronomical topics. Astronomy has really come a long way now that they got into doing some physics. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about astronomy, a little bit, a couple of examples from our forthcoming second edition, and then I'll spend a little bit more time talking about the so-called Trojan asteroids and uh, basically how Newtonian mechanics still work. Newtonian mechanics still work. Okay. Introduction of mechanics. Well, this would have to be uh, this would have to be complete. I have to show I have to show a picture of my co-author. He is about a year older than I. I'm going to be 79 in a couple of weeks, so he's either late 79 or 80. So we are we are just finishing our second edition. Our first edition came out in 1973. I'm not sure we're going to make it for the third edition. <laughs> but we're very pleased. Our book does not sell very much, but we feel it's making a real contribution to physics education. Okay, so there's Daniel. Here's our first edition. We all have copies around, so I don't need to show you that very much. Well, I couldn't, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't help putting this in Newton's cradle. Now this fellow here got two mistakes. One is child endangerment. <laughs> and the second is he obviously has not read our book because this is going to be a very inelastic collision. <laughs> it's not going to work. I watch television very little at home. But a couple of weeks ago, I was up in Crescent City, Northern California, and I had some time in the hotel room, so I turned on the television, and there was a program on Mythbusters. And they were trying to set up a Newton's Cradle with wrecking balls. Well, they said they couldn't get identical wrecking balls. So they got these big spherical buoys, hollow buoys, which they filled with concrete. So it looked like ball bearings and so on. Big mistake, very inelastic. You hit concrete with a hammer, it doesn't go boing and spring back. It's amazing, it's amazing how these, these materials can absorb energy in a system. So their, their wrecking ball model did not work at all. Then boom, that was it. Okay, uh, by the way, I'm very pleased to tell you this is not gonna be in our book. We do not, we do, not do things like that. It's sort of funny the first time you see it, but the tenth time it gets kind of old. So we don't, uh, we don't put that in our book. I just couldn't resist showing it today because this is what we do in mechanics. Energy, momentum, collisions, it's all here. Okay, but here is something that is in our book. Here's something that is in our book, in our chapter on rigid body motion. Uh, this is probably the one attempt at humor that we tried to put in our book. Can anybody tell me what this object is? The dreidel. The dreidel, yes. The four-sided top. It's played by Jewish children on festive uh, holidays. Uh, is it just Hanukkah or other holidays? <laughs> okay, anyway. So that's, that's the dreidel. The text does not say dreidel. But if you look in the index under dreidel, it refers to that page. <laughs> that's, our only, that's, our only, that's our only source of humor in the book. We're very serious. We're very serious state writers. How it came to be. Well, Daniel and I both were starting at MIT in the late 60s. And he said, you know, I think it was his idea. He said, you know, we have a lot of freshmen coming in that have a lot of preparation in calculus. But our ordinary physics freshman course, first term freshman physics, mechanics, 
doesn't make use of calculus for quite a while because the students are studying calculus concurrently, and so the physics people can't make use of calculus until somewhat into the term. He said, Daniel said, we should have a course that starts right out using calculus so that we can meet the needs of these more of these students who are better, are well prepared in calculus while the others catch up. So he said, well, I have a set of notes from Harvard, and so we use that. We, uh, oh my goodness, this was in the old days. They, uh, they copied those notes and they sold them at a modest price at the, in the bookstore for, to cover the cost of the paper and all that. <coughs> well, after the first year, and we took, by the way, we took turns lecturing. I would lecture for a few days, he would lecture for a few days. If we had a difficult demonstration, sometimes we both had to contribute. I remember the time we both came in on roller skates to do a tug of war. And I went down on the floor. When I got up, I said, okay, I'm okay, we're okay. So we had a lot of fun. Well, after the first year, we said, you know, that, that, went, that went pretty well, but you know, we could really rewrite a lot of those sections. We could really do a better job there. So here's the way we worked. One of us would take responsibility for doing the draft of a section. And we'd write a draft, and we'd pass it on to the other. And they'd rewrite it, pass it back. Eventually, we came to a pretty good meeting of minds. And then we sat down at the desk, shoulder to shoulder, and we rewrote it word by word, line by line. We learned a lot about writing. <laughs> I remember once we had a sentence that had the phrase, it plays a role has three times in the same sentence. Oh my goodness. We're better than that now. And we had a lot of trouble with undefined it. It does or it is. What is the it? What is that it? Well, we did that for seven years. We did that for seven years. And the, uh, in those days, we'd write with pencil and paper. He had access to a, a secretary. They typed it up. We put in hand-drawn sketches. They sold it in the bookstore for a moderate price. Well, after about seven years, a representative from McGraw-Hill Publishing came by and said, well, I hear you fellows have a big set of developed notes in freshman physics. Well, one thing led to another, and so we did actually have the book published by McGraw-Hill, who was big in science those days, published in 1973 how the years go by. <clears throat> well, a few years ago, Daniel and I thought, you know, that the years are going by. If we're going to do something with this book, a second edition, we better get on it. McGraw-Hill did not want to do a second edition. I think it's because we didn't sell very many copies. They had a tendency, I have to tell you, that the fewer our sales, the higher the price. It was not really. They were selling it for a really high figure. Well, we got the copyright back from McGraw-Hill. We signed a contract with Cambridge University Press. And Cambridge University Press has reprinted the uh, first edition. It's one of them right there. So we printed the first edition. They're working now on the second edition, which will come out next spring, God willing. So, uh, and they, they cut the price in half, which we were very pleased. We get a percentage but we thought McGraw-Hill was selling it for way too high a price. So we're very pleased that it's being sold at a price a little more reasonable. This is a little hard to see, because this is the way it came out. I had no choice about it. I just couldn't make it work properly. Uh, for the second edition, we wrote, and I did, I did mainly, we wrote the, we wrote the uh, manuscript in typesetting software. You write a script file. This is a script file. And I'm sorry you can't see it better, but it's, it's the text, but there are many different commands and marks here. There are marks here, here's a mark, here's a four lines, five lines, where to put a picture. Here, uh, there are material, here's, here, write an equation. This is an equation here, bold face, that's a vector. So it has all these commands that we need to know to make this thing uh, typeset properly. Fractions, here's a fraction. 
have the numerator and has the denominator. So uh, this was a, uh, for a 500 page book, there's a lot of script writing. Well, ah, this is what I just showed you after it's typeset, which takes a fraction of a minute. Has equations, numbered as we wish, bold face vectors. This section right here is about the reduction of the two-body central force problem to the one-body central force problem, which you're all familiar with. In fact, it's something, kind of a, a theme in the talk I'm going to give today. Let's go to that. I'm going to take two examples from our second edition. As I said, our theme here is partly Newtonian mechanics, and it's partly, uh, partly the uh, wonder wonderful advances in astronomy and physics. If we have two objects in orbit with a central force motion, you can see the motion is actually around the center of mass. So if one object is fairly massive compared to the other, this object, maybe a planet, undergoes a large orbit, and the sun, or whatever this is, undergoes a much smaller orbit, but as you see there, they both rotate around the center of mass. This is kind of interesting because as this star, this star wobbles, as this planet circles around, the star wobbles. And it is this phenomenon that has been used by the Kepler satellite to, uh, to uh, study, to invest, to discover, discover planets around exo star stars outside our solar system. Exo means outer. So planets outside our solar system have been discovered by the Kepler satellite using the wobble. Because the wobble, as the star moves back and forth, there's a Doppler shift. There's a Doppler shift in the light from the star. And so by looking at that, get some idea of the, uh, of the physics, what's involved in that planet. Now, if the planet is fairly massive and fairly far away, the wobble's going to be quite, quite a bit larger. But if the planet is fairly light and close in, the wobble will be much smaller because the center of mass will be maybe within the star itself. Here's some data. Unfortunately, our second edition is not in color, but we do have this graph in the second edition. <coughs> These, uh, this is a star, Visa 876. It's about 15 light years from the Earth. And uh, it has, here's two of the planets that have been discovered by the uh, Gliese, at M Gliese 876. Now you see this one has a very short period. It has a very short period, just a, a few days, a day or two. And you see that the Doppler shift here, only a few meters per second. Well, we can understand that because by Kepler's third law, the square of the period is proportional to the cube of the major, axim, the major axis. So a very short period here, that means the major axis is pretty short. So this, this planet is pretty close to the star. It's pretty close to the star and doesn't cause very much wobble although it, it is visible. Here, in the same star, Lisa 876, this star has a much longer period. It's obviously farther away from the star, and so correspondingly, the wobble is much bigger, a few hundred, a few hundred meters per second as the star wobbles back and forth, rotating around the center of mass. So, uh, remarkable, remarkable things. Uh, <coughs> With the accuracies here, it would appear that the Earth would not probably be detectable from out some other, from out some other place. Although I must say that things are improving all the time, and that may not really still be a true statement. So this was one of my uh, examples, the exoplanet <coughs> example. Now here's an example that Daniel came up with. This is a cosmic Keplerian orbit around the black hole at the center of our galaxy. Sagittarius A star, SGR A star. 
the black hole. This is Sagittarius A star. And here are readings on the orbit over various periods of time. It's a little incomplete, but I'm going to show another graph where they have done the complete orbit. This is a star. This is a star going around Kepler, the uh, Sagittarius A star black hole. The major, the, the major axis of this orbit is about 11 light days. Huge, a huge orbit. Just for comparison, Jupiter. Jupiter, the diameter of the Jupiter orbit, which is very nearly circular, the diameter of Jupiter's orbit is about 86 light minutes. So this, this, this star is just swinging, just swinging way out, okay, swinging way out around the uh, Sagittarius A star. This is a little harder to see, and it's in color, but they do have orbital uh, measurements all the way around the orbit, all the way around the orbit. And they, uh, they, determine, they determine the shape of the orbit by fitting orbital parameters. So it's 11 light days across. That means here at the nearest approach to the, uh, to the attractor, at the nearest approach to the, to the attractor, the star is whizzing along. For comparison, the Earth is moving at about, I think something like 10 or 15 kilometers per second around the sun. This star near the black hole is moving at about 7,000 kilometers per second. Because it's got 11 light days, its period is about uh, 15 years. Its period is about, it's very, very not, not far from Jupiter. Jupiter is about 12 years. This is about 15 years, but it's a huge, huge orbit compared to the orbit of Jupiter. By using Kepler's law, square the period proportional to the cube of the major axis, they have determined a, me a measurement of the mass of the black hole. It turns out to be about four million times the mass of our sun. That's considered to be a relatively small black hole because there are black holes known billions of times that are more massive than our sun. So this one, the center of our, near the center of our galaxy, and we think it is near the center too because measurements seem to indicate that it moves, it's moving very little. It's moving, it's not rotating around something else. It's moving very little. So those are two examples from our second edition. Unfortunately, not in color, but uh, we're trying to, uh, trying to show some real data and keep up with new advances. Oh yes, this one. Our book is being published by Cambridge University Press, and so we said, well, we would like a color different from the bright blue that we have now. And the editor said, oh yes, we'll make a post box red. In England, the post box is where you put your mail. Those are these slots. And so post boxes are typically with cylinders which are painted red. So it's going to be somewhere, something along those lines. It will be clearly distinguishable from the first edition. So post box red. Okay. So much for the book. Let's look now, Trojan asteroids, an astronomical topic here. Uh, this is more or less visible, I hope. Here we have the sun. Here we have the orbit of Jupiter. And here an interesting feature, a big clump of asteroids, thousands probably, and another big clump of asteroids here. The first ones discovered were named after characters in the Iliad, the Trojan War, as we call the, at least part one year of the Trojan War as recounted by Homer. Some of these also were named after the, uh, some of the Greek heroes in the Trojan War. Well, there are many thousands now, so I think they, they can't name them all that way. Here's the remarkable feature. If you look at Jupiter and the Sun, and if you look at the clump of asteroids, they pretty much form an equilateral triangle. Pretty much both leading, a leading group, and a trailing group on the orbit of Jupiter at or near. You're a little spread out. We'll see a 
a reason why later on. So uh, this is a remarkable, remarkable phenomenon. As you well know, the two-body problem with central forces is easily solved by reduction to a one-body problem. However, the three-body problem has never been solved exactly with central forces. However, some special solutions have been found. Lagrange, in 1772, found several special solutions of a three-body problem, assuming that the masses move in circular orbits acting under the gravitational force. However, and we'll see in a moment that his calculations in 1772 help explain what I just showed you with the asteroids moving on the Jupiter to Jovian orbit. Those weren't observed until 1906 in the Sun-Jupiter system. They weren't observed until 1906, so Lagrange had a, uh, a pretty, pretty good, uh, pretty good uh, analysis there using Newtonian mechanics, but it wasn't shown uh, in nature until 1906. The Earth is not very good, it's not ma massive enough to collect asteroids. But the Earth-Sun system does have at least one, one Trojan asteroid discovered last year. So it's a, it's a and, and Neptune and Pluto have quite a bunch also. Okay, let's look now at that analysis. Here's an equilateral triangle. I call this the sun, but it's really just three masses. Three, three masses on an equilateral triangle. The mass is going to be, the ma I'm assuming that this, this, what I call the asteroid here, has a relatively small mass so that the center of mass lies pretty much on a line between the planet and the sun. The center of mass, x sub s, distance to the sun, x sub p, distance from the center of mass to the planet. And as you can see, if, uh, if the mass, if the, if the sun, if the planet is much less massive than the sun, then this distance is nearly as long as the side of the equilateral triangle. And this distance between the sun and the center of mass is much smaller than the side of the, of the equilateral triangle. Let's look at the forces involved. The equations of motion. Now from the planet, we're assuming circular orbits. Now for Jupiter, it has an eccentricity of 0.05, so it's very close to circular. So it's going to apply pretty well. So here we are, uh, the mass of the planet, the radius from the center of mass, omega squared, mr omega squared, same old stuff, gravitational force due to the sun. We're taking the asteroid to be very small, so its gravitational force is negligible. It can be included, but the geometry gets even worse than it really is. It's bad enough now. So here is the, here is the uh, uh, rotational frequency, rotational velocity of the, uh, of the uh, oh, that should be a small m, but that's the way it goes. The sun, similarly, mass times radius arm times the square of the velocity, uh, angular velocity, and it comes out really should be the same as we expect because the Sun and the Jupiter are both revolving around the center of mass. So they both have the same angular frequency here. Okay, now what about the asteroid? That's the interesting part. Here's the asteroid, mr omega squared, omega prime, I'm not calling it omega yet. Here's the gravitational force due to the Sun, and here's the gravitational force due to the planet. So that's what's acting on this asteroid of small mass. Okay, with a little vector algebra here, a little vector algebra. Here's the uh, interesting part. When we add these two equations, when we add these two equations, these two terms cancel because they're the definition of the center of mass in vector form. So these two terms cancel, what do we have left? That this, uh, this term and this term 
is equal to the sum of the masses times the radius arm. The radius from the asteroid to the center of mass. And what does it come out to be? It comes out to be omega squared r. It comes out to be, and again, I'm having trouble with my cases here. It comes out to be the same angular velocity as the sun and the planet. So this was uh, one, one of the things. So what happens is this equilateral triangle is just constantly as it kind of keeping its form and it's rotating around its center of mass. So this thing is rotating around its center of mass, equilateral triangle. We'll see later why the asteroids are a little bit strung out. But uh, this, this, this thing will keep its shape as Jupiter orbits the sun. The asteroids orbit along with it. So that was a good, a good discovery, a good calculation by Lagrange. What we have just discussed has come to be known as the Lagrange point L4. See, here it is, the equilateral triangle. Uh, this is drawn for the Earth, but as I said, the Earth has trouble capturing asteroids. So whatever, it's a planet, some kind of mass here. So L4 is a Lagrange point. It's a point that will hold, it'll hold its, its position as, the, as everything is circula circulating around, as everything is rotating around. There's a leading, L, L4 is the leading one, L5 is the trailing one. So those two. And he also found three more special cases. L1, which is between the planet and the sun. L2, which is on the other side of the planet. And L3, which is very near the orbit, the other side of the sun. These also, these also, rotate around by a similar calculation, you could easily show that they rotate around as the planet is moving around its orbit. We're going to show in a few minutes that actually L1, L2, and L3, asteroids at those positions would not be stable. We're not going to show that, but I'll, I'm going to show L4. I'm going to show L4. It turns out that L1, L2, and L3, an asteroid at that position is not stable, that if it departs slightly from that equilibrium point, it could sail off into space. So we don't, uh, we're not going to see big clumps of asteroids at these positions. I'm not going to go into any detail here, but if you look into this, they find that putting, an ast uh, putting an a, uh, a satellite, here's one right here, putting a satellite near these points has some big advantages for saving fuel and doing useful things, but that's beyond, <coughs> beyond what I'm saying today. So, stability. So what happens if our asteroid departs from its, from <coughs> its equilibrium position? So it's now in a new position, x and y. We're going to assume that x and y is a small displacement in the calculations, this helps doing, cal doing approximations. Now the asteroid is still acted upon by the gravitational force of the big mass MS, and by this mass MP, the planet mass. And uh, here is the, here is the, uh, here's the radius vector to the, from the asteroid to the center of mass. This is a miserable long Algebra, vector algebra calculation. Terrible. Ah, let's get into it here. Does that equal MA? Well, if you're in a non inertial system, no. The real forces do not equal MA if you are in a non inertial system. What we want to do here for this calculation, we want to see, we want to see how this uh, we want to see the motion of this thing as it when it's displaced from its equilibrium point. So a good way to do that is to go into a rotating coordinate system. We can use a rotating coordinate system rotating about the center of mass with angular velocity omega. So then we'll just this will be stationary. This will be sta this or this point at least this point will be stationary in that rotating coordinate system 
And so we can just see what kind of motion this thing is going to take. So that's the, that's the plan. To make it work in a rotating coordinate system, this is one of our long calculations in the book, but it's very worthwhile because we show that all of these tricky geometric effects of rotation, they're all taken into account if you put in two fictitious forces, add them to the real forces, and that entirely compensates for the geometry of the rotation. So the centrifugal force omega cross omega cross r, and the Coriolis force omega cross the rotation, the vo velocity in the rotating system. So there we have it. These are fictitious forces. They're not physical. And what they do is they help us apply Newton's law, F equals ma, including the fictitious forces. We don't have to worry about the tricky geometry of the rotational motion. We're going to be dealing uh, in the xy plane, and so the angular velocity vector is in the z direction. So this whole thing is rotating around. Oh my goodness. After 10 pages of algebra, this is what we get. After 10 pages of algebra, here is the, uh, the, uh, the accelerate, here's the accelerate, the x acceleration. And uh, you can see these are somewhat complicated equations. Here's the Coriolis force part right here. And you can see here that the x equation includes y and the y velocity. And the y equation includes x and the x velocity. So these are not real simple equations to, uh, to solve. You may say, where, 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 do we, where do we get square root of 3 in all this stuff? From the apex of an equilateral triangle, perpendicular to the side, that's square root of 3 over 2. So that's where the square root of 3 comes from. It comes from the geometry of an equilateral triangle. So here, here's everything. Omega, of course, is a constant. That's the rotational velocity of our coordinate system and our system. How can we solve this? Well, here's an approach. Let's assume that x equals e to the lambda t, and y equals something times e to the lambda t. The nice thing about exponentials is when you take their derivatives, you still have the exponential. So e to the lambda t cancels out everywhere when we do x double dot, x dot, y dot, and so on. Here's what we get in simple form. We get some conglomeration of all the parameters times big A, some conglomeration of the parameters times big B equals zero. So we get two equations, and we look at this and we say, well, obviously one solution is big A and big B are both zero. Nothing. There is no motion. X and Y are zero. Trivial response, trivial answer. How do we get a real answer out of equations of homogeneous form? Well, the answer is that these will have a non-trivial solution if this determinant of the coefficients is zero, because then, uh, then the equation wouldn't solve properly when you try to solve it. So if you do all that, work out the determinant, and so on, you end up with a nice equation here. It's quadratic in lambda squared, the frequency e to the lambda t. It's quadratic in lambda squared. And it's a relatively simple equation. This will give us the frequencies involved in the motion of this asteroid when it departs from its equilibrium position. We can look at this right now for a minute here. Now gamma, you see, is very, with a massive sun, gamma would be very close to one. So in the limit, in the limit, this term is pretty much zero. So that means that lambda squared is minus omega squared. So lambda is plus or minus i omega, purely imaginary. That's a good sign, purely imaginary. Similarly, if, uh, if, the, if, this is really, uh, if this is a worthwhile term, well, let's do the actual example here. Here are the roots. They're purely imaginary. They're purely imaginary. 
What does that mean? There are four roots. There are pairs, complex conjugates, different values. There are two different values. There are two different frequencies involved in this motion. So the question is here, what is this? That means we're dealing with sines and cosines. We have a pair of complex conjugates. They're purely imaginary. And so we get sines and cosines. Let's look at this just briefly before we go on. This kind of interesting form here. You see here that if, uh, if gamma is, uh, if this term, one minus gamma squared, if that term is big enough, if that term is big enough, this square root could be the square root of a, ne a negative number. And so this itself would be a complex number. That means there would be a real part. That means if there's a real part, that means the solution has real exponentials. That means the motion is not stable. With real exponentials, it could go sailing away. But in our case, if we keep, uh, if we keep gamma near to 1, if we keep gamma near to 1, actually, uh, the critical value is, uh, yeah, critical value, the ratio of the two masses, the planet and the sun, or the whatever it is, uh, has to be less than 0.04. The, the planet has to be, uh, the sun or planet, the sun has to be less than, less than more than 25 times the mass of the planet. Earth-Moon system, it's a factor of 10. Uh, so it works okay. But unfortunately, our system doesn't collect asteroids very easily. So here is our solution. Some number, cosine, sine, two frequencies, omega-1 and omega-2, given by these ex expressions. And y, v1, v2, v3, v4, cosine, sine, cosine, sine, sine. Terrible algebra, let me tell you. Now you look at this and you say, well, you've got something here wrong here because you've got eight undetermined constants. But there are only four initial conditions. The initial position, x, y. The initial velocity, x dot, y dot. There are only four initial conditions. But don't forget that these values have to satisfy the equation of motion, which puts together x and y. So once we have assumed a form for x, the form for y can be calculated directly. In other words, the b's here are actually depend upon the a's. They're not independent. But they have to satisfy, they have to satisfy the equation of motion. Okay? Um, it's amazing what sines and cosines can do. I put together a little trial program. I got out my old Fortran compiler. <laughs> it was put out by Microsoft in 1990 to be used with MS-DOS. Still runs with Windows 7. Pretty <laughs> wonderful. It said it won't run my printer, but that's okay. OK, here is an example. Uh, this is, this is uh, I, couldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't finish an actual example. This is not the Sun-Jupiter system. It's just a pseudo, it's just an example of what this could turn into. It's amazing what sines and cosines can do. So you see that even though the asteroid is stable, the it bound doesn't, doesn't go away. It's stable, does not go away. But you see, it, it, can, it can move over long paths. And so I think this is probably a good reason why those asteroid clumps are kind of spread out on the orbit of Jupiter. It, I was amazed when I saw this. And of course, this is as seen in the rotating coordinate system. So this whole clump is rotating around the center of mass along, along with the, in the orbit of, of the planet. This whole thing is rotating around on the orbit. So uh, there we have it. Thank you. That was really any questions, questions or comments? Yeah. Um, so we have a few minutes for questions. If anyone has any. Uh,
The first is what can you can we use the uh, potential energy associated with the gravitation to calculate the stability of the asteroid? Because the energy is kind of easier compared to the uh, yes, you, yes, yes, that is, but, but uh, I believe the calculations don't simplify very much. Oh, I should have mentioned one thing I wanted to mention too. You, of course, if you've taken a course in advanced mechanics, you know the name of Lagrange because he devised Lagrangian. He eliminated force from Newtonian mechanics in favor of energy. So he's noted for that. But he's also noted for his, uh, what turned out to be important astronomical results. Uh, I think what you say is correct, but as far as I can tell, the amount of algebra are pretty much the same. Because okay. I have seen treatments where they do use the energy method. Uh, what they do, uh, it's one of those things where they, they, uh, they diagonalize the matrix and, oh my goodness, you know that. So just eat a the lambda t, it does the job. So you can do it, you can do it several different ways. And I get a result. Get the get the right result. Mm. Yes. Uh, so uh, what happens when you put the system in three D? What you solve? The I'm sorry. When you solve the system in three dimensions? Well, this is uh, planetary motion, so because of the conservation of angular momentum, it's restricted to a plane. Mm -hmm. Angular so momentum is conserved. Uh, what if and what, what if you have the, the object? Yeah, like oh, if the asteroid if the yeah. asteroid moves uh, in the z direction yeah. too. Yeah. Boy, I've never seen that carried out. That's the, okay. You want to do another 20 pages of algebra? Yes. <laughs> I could do that. Um, that's, not, that's kind of interesting because z, z does not appear in the equations of motion. Oh, but it would. It would because if it goes in the z direction, then the, the radius vector, the gravitational force, would also have a z component. Uh, so that would add into the z component would show up in the gravitational force in the equation of motion. So I, I assume that it, it will still be stable in the z direction, right? Well, they've been there for a while, so I guess mm -hmm. they probably are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good point. Yes, again. Can I ask another question? Yeah, yeah, please. Do we need to account for the orbital precession of the Jupiter orbit? Oh, actually, because the, the orbital of the Jupiter is precession. Well, it's rotating, uh, uh, rotating around at or near the orbit of Jupiter, but it's still staying pretty much in the, in the equilateral triangle configuration as it goes around. Okay. Yeah. But looked at in more detail, the motion, I think, is pretty complicated. Yes? Were there any new examples you considered for the second edition of your book that didn't make it? Any? Uh, uh, let's see. Oh, my, are there any, are any examples in the second edition that we did not actually include? You know, it's been such a long period. Mm -hmm. I know we, we, we sent things back and forth to each other. Mm -hmm. And, uh, oh, yes, I wanted to, uh, in, the, uh, in the chapter on momentum, Momentum, and a momentum transfer. I was trying to do a two, two problems. One, on how a bottle rocket works, which I did pretty well, but didn't make it. And I also wanted something on how a windmill works, or a wind turbine. That didn't make it either. So those were, those were, those were two of mine that didn't make it, so I, I know those for sure. <laughs> but we have others that did make it. And we improved. We, we, we did rewrite the book very considerably. We dropped some chapters. We put in some new chapters. And so we, uh, we hope it's better. OK. And some new, new problems. Got some new, kept, kept some of the good old problems. But we have some new problems, too. Yes? What's your favorite problem in the book? I'm sorry? What's your favorite problem in the book? My favorite problem? Oh, I sort of like the one with the uh, ball bouncing off the moving wall. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a good one. Oh, we had we had one that wasn't actually an example, but it took us quite a bit of work. How to calculate the gravitational redshift? J 
just using the principle of equivalence. And that the speed of light is finite. Those two things. So we uh, actually, actually, we actually did work out with a little bit of little bit of manipulation, a little bit of approximation here and there, did actually get a result with gravitational redshift. Clocks run at different rates depending on where they are in the gravitational field. And we, can, we did that by the principle of equi equivalence, that a gravitational field and an acceleration are indistinguishable on the local level. All right, so if you don't have any more questions, okay. we'll thank once again. Thank you so much.